good morning to all of you ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as the theme suggests, cultivating global competencies in tomorrow's leaders, a teacher's guide to student preparation. The panel discussion today will help us uh, answer questions on how systems can support teachers to be globally engaged and transformative in their teaching. Uh, as you see the line of panelists line today, uh, we have a blend of both uh, academics and industry. And uh, we are very fortunate that they've given us this time. And we know how busy your schedules are. Um, as I was preparing questions as to you know, how best we can make use of our panel, uh, I was quite constrained that I have a lot of questions, but I have a, you know, the time limit that's given is extremely less. But I'll try and see if we can really together gain most of what our panelists have to say. So let's begin without uh, further delay. Uh, I will first pose our uh, questions to all our panelists at this point of time. Uh, as you see law as a profession, uh, it's seen a widespread change, not just domestically, but uh, globally as well over the last decade, due to multiple developments in the field of law and allied principles. So what do you think should be the key skills, you know, which are very, very crucial for, you know, tomorrow's legal professionals and leaders so that, you know, we probably are there to strive in the ever-changing professional knowledge. So I would request all of you to, you know, throw in your inputs for us. Uh, the mic is there, so in case you want some help, please do let us know. You know, the most interesting thing right now is um, law has almost become a foundational degree. I remember when I graduated, it was only a postgraduate course. Uh, you could only do it after you did your uh, graduation uh, degree and then you had a three-year law course. Uh, today, with the five-year law course, it's become more foundational. The other piece of it is the only thing I could uh, tell you know, my children and, st and, and people who work with me is I don't remember going to class. I literally probably spent a lot of my three years in the canteen. And, uh, you know, I, I still remember the ban maska chai. But the level of conversations that we would have, and by second year, we all had started working. And we really learned on the job. I think one thing that students have very fortunately today is that there is a very robust academic system with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, dedicated educators and, and just having this conference and I thank uh, you know uh, Dr. Murthy, RV University and Manupatra for organizing something like this which I don't remember would have ever happened yes. when we were in college. So I think that's that itself shows sort of the changing nature of what law can bring. The second thing I wanted to really talk about is everybody's been watching Davos and the World Economic Forum put out a list of skills that are required for tomorrow's uh, uh, graduates. And none of them refer to anything what we call hard skills. A whole list today is only of soft skills that are required for any profession and especially law. We are today dealing in a world where codified law is taken for granted. There is no law for half the things that are happening today. Or there is ambiguous law. Or people don't know what law should be. So I think these skills, and I'm going to read out a few of them, are just really important to look at when we look at creating the law students of tomorrow. The first one really is analytical thinking and innovation. I don't think innovation was something that we ever looked at in a legal profession to make up something. right? The other one is active learning and learning strategies. Because it is not stagnant, law is always changing. And today, law is developing and being created new. You know, we never thought that, you know, Contract Act 1972, it still holds today. But the laws that are happening today are changing completely. Complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis. This is the world of big data. So coming from the IT and tech industry, one of the big things today is data. Information is rampant. How to analyze and use it is something that is a skill that we, we really need to get developed. And then we look at technology. Uh, you know, I think on one hand, we tend to believe that our new generation knows technology because they can use a smartphone. But that's not technology. 
a lot of them cannot use a basic Excel spreadsheet or do statistics or trend analysis on big data. So while we have really smart, very communicative students, I think there are aspects of this new world, especially with AI, that require a different set of skills. So today we've been experimenting with AI products in legal profession where it can mark up your document automatically. It can see a document, see a template and mark it up. The question is, do I have a lawyer who has the skills to figure out whether that markup is correct or wrong? Or from whose side is that markup, the buyer or the seller? So those kind of skills are, are, are very different today. And the last one I would say really is resilience. Uh, the whole aspect of change is something that is not usual for lawyers to have. But the pace of change today is so rapid that that resilience to accept change and keep learning and not get disappointed by failures along the way I think it's something from, you know, from my standpoint, the new generation needs to really look at. New laws, lack of laws, ambiguous laws, inconsistent laws, very different from all the laws that we learned 25 years ago. So a whole different set of skills are required for, for these. Thank you. Deepa, would you want to add in? Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I would like to thank uh, RV University, Manupatra, and our own community, GCI, has you know, uh, called us and given this opportunity to be here. Um, I'm, I'm very delighted and excited and uh, very, very nostalgic moments, okay, when I was coming through the college and looking at the students, you know, very sincerely, as, as Tejal indicated. A couple of years ago, right, um, very, very limited uh, knowledge or focus about a legal profession. You, you study, you will land up in the court practice. And uh, being a in-house counsel, I would like to share a couple of thoughts here. And uh, first-gen lawyer in my family. Okay? It's, it's a bit struggle. You, you may not even know where to lead, how to lead, where, what would be your vision. So uh, in, in that context, when we are trying to look at it, uh, what needs to be studied. So it's, it's a very, very defined curriculum and we all need to focus on the marks, right? The, the score, what we are getting, how we are going to be a topper and all those angles. But we never thought about it, what, how this law is going to help me for future or what I'm going to give it back to the society as a noble profession. So I think that's the point. Still, it's, it's unanswered. I think that's where as a... Uh, legal educators or probably academic or a student, you all need to look at it and create a vision. Okay. Uh, predominantly, you all will agree, right? Or, or many of us agree and acknowledge that. What we have been taught in law or what you are learning today, right? That's completely different or gap between that to the what you are expected to do on the job or as a practical professional legal professional. I think that's the gap we all try to mitigate here or look at it how we can do that out. And legal professional is really going, moving forward um, where we need to reshape or build ourselves to empower and encourage and keep as a better legal professional in the society. So I'm not sure how many of you really know that out as an in-house team what we do, whether you are part of a legal team or you are heading the legal function, it doesn't matter. So you, you own your own mini law firm, I can say that out, right? So you are catering to your exclusive customer, which is your enterprise. So over a period, it will be in one company or you will be doing it for entire group. So as part of your journey, you will tend to do advising or part of a business to take in strategic decisions. So it, it varies. It, it, it varies with, with the uh, domains and skills. You should acquire it. If you look at it, end-to-end um, -end contract like exceptional management. We used to have a team. And in, in 20 years ago, when I started, I still remember uh, the end-to-end energy really kept you know, um, 
ahead of the other peers, I can say. If we get a one non-disclosure agreement, it is a four-pager. We don't know what to look at it. In, as, as Tejal said, Indian Contract Act would have defined confidentiality agreement and what is a contract agreement plus uh, executable by law is equal to an uh, uh, contract which is under Section 10, all this. But, but if you look at it on the practical ground, the corporate doesn't expect that or the society doesn't expect that in the papers. You need to look at it. What is the term, duration, what kind of a liability which is going to create? Is it, are you going to disclose or receiving as a position which keeps varying on that part? So it's one is a contract. I think everybody may look at it, okay, in-house, if I get it, it's just the contracts, right? It's not. So the wider portfolio which may tend to handle today, intellectual property portfolio of the organizations and uh, compliances in terms of today, the compliance is becoming an oceans and nightmares, secretarials, data privacy compliance or employment compliance, the new emerging labor codes are coming out and ESG is the one other one. Litigation management, being a lawyer, I always suggest you, you will never get away from your litigation. You are being in a corporate or you may be in an academic or anywhere. You tend to learn and you have to be part. Your skin has to be in the game. So these are all some of these portfolios which we broadly handle as an in-house. And as an enterprises or changing economic you know, industries today demands that the legal professional to be having an Knowledge, not only in legal, you should also have, know about your technology, what's growing, AI, blockchain, how it is going to change your legal profession or what kind of role you are going to do. So that's where you can keep upskill and reskill. And uh, you should know your commercial augment. What is your P&L? How the finance is uh, growing, company is growing, what can be attributable? I think these aspects, statistics, you have to talk to the management or your leadership only with the data. You cannot go within five minutes or 10 minutes discussion. You have to go within five bullet points to transact or interact with a complex commercial transaction. That's it. So you should need to simplify, demystify your complex problem into a simple solution. That's a key skill which is required today. You have to be a business strategic partner, no more a support function. Legal is no more a support function. Please, let's, let's be very clear on it in any, any organizations today. Um, you have to be a gatekeeper. You have to be a decision maker. Not only to your management, not only to the stakeholders. At times, you are part of a board. Many of us are part of a board. And we, we change the table on some of the new business line which is getting emerging on it. Um, in addition to that, I, I just would like to also add that um, you should also have a global competency today, right? The business today, it's not only India. You may work out of Bangalore or you may work out of any part of India, but uh, you may be handling the business which is across the other 120 countries. Um, your business remains same. India also, you are doing the same business, but the compliance, the law, requirements, governance, which is required with the different countries are different. And culturally, you will tend to coordinate with a different set of mindset of a people with a diverse background. Um, so ultimate key line is preventive lawyering. Wherever we are, preventive lawyering is the key aspect which we drive lean machine across the company to minimize the risk as well as to um, uh, prevent the dispute at the first instance. I think that's where we, we need to go. That, that fundamental uh, fire always remains with us. But with the dynamic and changing technology, definitely we need to embrace on that. Yeah. Professor Avinash, interestingly, is a blend of both academic and industry. So we would want to listen from him. Uh, I think that's more confusing, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the simple question that is skill sets required for students. Uh, normally, when someone asks you a very simple question, it really confuses you that what should be the real answer. When you talk about the skill set required for the students, I think uh, it goes back to the classical debate, the, you know, the purpose of legal education. So if you see the Anglo-Saxon approach, then their approach is very simple, like in UK, US, and other countries, that when you're going to a law school, you want to become a lawyer. Okay, You want to become a judge or a lawyer, and you will be in the legal industry. So different legal set. It's like an MBA. Okay, You want a job mostly, and we are training you to get a job. 
Then there is a continental approach in France, Spain, in continental world, you know, continental European countries that uh, law is like, as uh, Tejal said, it's a founding degree, you know. It's not necessary that you want to make your career in law, but you want to do law like in a uh, licence in uh, France, Bécalieu in France. You study law for three to four years, you explore yourself, then you decide what you want to do in your life. Maybe if you want to become a lawyer, then you go to a lawyer's school. You want to become a judge, you go to a judge's school. Or maybe you want to do something else. So I think this debate is very interesting, especially in our Indian scenario, because some, somehow I think I'm t speaking like a teacher right now. We are following the Anglo-Saxon approach. And uh, most of the law schools now in India are just talking about placement, employability, it's fine, I'm not opposing that idea, but at the same time, should we consider the other option also, the Anglo-Saxon, uh, this continental approach, where students are choosing legal education after 12th. So not necessary that they should be a lawyer or they should be a judge. Maybe they can be something else. And this five year or maybe three year education journey should empower them to dream something different, dream something big. So I think this is the one area where you, we uh, teachers need to focus, you know, when we talk about the skill set. So it depends on our approach. If you want to give them a job, then maybe different skill set is required. Frankly speaking, I don't want to talk very big things. Uh, when you want to get an entry level job, skill set is different. You know, you just need to be disciplined. Uh, you need to have some basic understanding of technology. And uh, then some good grades, some good internships, good exposure, and some good business sense. So this is how you will end up with a entry level job in a company or in a law firm. And then there will still I believe that you really learn when you start doing things, you know. Definitely our Indian law schools are still not in a situation where we can train students for something real. But at least we can do some simulation type of process where from the day one, they don't become a burden on, you know, people, they start adding some value. So for that skill set, when you ask me about the employability, it's a basic thing is technology. Yes, I completely agree with uh, Tizel that uh, most of the law school students have no idea about Excel. Uh, PPT, I think still people are <laughs> using very basic PPTs. Uh, even students are not very comfortable with Microsoft Word. Forget about advanced technologies. Microsoft Word still students are not very comfortable that how to use it in a nice manner. Talking about advanced technologies, I think this is very interesting area. In last October, I was invited at ET at Zurich in Switzerland to talk about AI policy. And there was a special session on AI in education. Very interesting workshop by those professors where they doing research how to teach chat GPT to students. It's interesting. They said ki, we need to teach our students how to use generative AI for their research, for their reading, writing, and everything. So there has to be one generative AI buddy for them, and they need to learn how to work with that buddy, that technology. So I think that's another area, you know, when I talk about the future lawyers, Technology is going to be very big part and unfortunately, you know, most of the law schools, it's absolutely missing. Even the law professors are not comfortable with technology and we don't teach technology in law schools. This is something very serious. And in my law school from next year, I'm going to teach all these technologies to students like, see this uh, Manupatra, you know, this uh, products. We need to teach these products in the law school. Unfortunately, we are not teaching them. So that's a one thing, technology, uh, employment part. Second part is uh, skill set. I think globalization. India is evolving. India is, uh, after five years, students are going to work in a different India, which we have never seen in our life. Very developed type of India, globalized India. I agree with uh, Madam that, you know, uh, maybe you are sitting in India, but maybe you are dealing with more than 30 to 40 countries' jurisdictions. So this cultural understanding, globalization doesn't mean only law. 
because laws are written on paper so you can read understand they are not very complicated you know it looks very complicated just like medicine medicine looks very complicated to us because we don't understand but if you talk to doctors they understand very nicely okay what does it mean i think when i talk about globalization i am not talking about the understanding of the global rules or regulations i am talking about the cultural understanding you know how to deal with people how to integrate into different cultures i think that's where we are very weak in india if you talk about indian lawyers or even the indian law professors uh, we are not exposed to different cultures uh, definitely uk us is not only the world i think there are a lot of countries they speak different languages they have different cultural set so we need to teach our students how to integrate into different cultures so that's a part of employability but still i am not a big fan of only employability i think we need to explore i like to give this suggestion to all law teachers that we need to explore beyond employability also can we say them okay this is a five year law degree please explore yourself maybe you want to become something else why it's happening all in iits that you do btech in mechanical engineering and then you set up a top class company you know why that is not happening in law schools i appreciate one guy i think i just forget the uh, ram uh, lo sikho i think that guy they just i think issued their ipo yesterday and and within 25 minutes their ipo is 100% subscribed so why we are not able to create leaders out of law schools and not and leaders not necessarily in law side i think we lawyers law professors are very equipped to understand the society because we understand finance we understand society politics i think we should train our students we should motivate our students ki see this is not necessary that you become a lawyer or a judge or work in a legal profession you can do something else i think that is really missing in our law school so for that skill set i think we need to make them more free we need to give the more interdisciplinary learning and i agree with azal frank i i admit you know i confess that i did my law from delhi university faculty of law and uh, after my first semester i never attended any class and i was really very good in my education i was very active in moot court debate politics uh, all other things but not in classroom why i am saying this it's not required if you want to do something else in your life you want to become a practicing lawyer you need to do something more in society i am not saying that everybody should do it i was part of i was very active in student politics i was the president of student union so i am not saying that everybody should do it but what i am trying to say that classroom is not must if someone wants to make career in some other areas we need to give them some space if we don't give them space if you don't give them that autonomy my professors were very cooperative they knew that okay this guy is what i'm trying to say that this second part this continental part exploring part if any student is genuinely interested in some other areas we should motivate we should not force them no no you need to be legal or it doesn't work like that no if someone wants to do politics allow him to go out if someone wants to set up an ngo some social activities allow them classroom is not that necessary the real classroom is life the real classroom is society we should help them as a low teachers unfortunately we don't do because attendance is 75% i think we need to no no i, I as sm i am very happy if someone comes to me and says sir i want to set up an ngo and i want some relaxation attendance i will be very happy to give we need to give that environment to students to explore experiment outside of legal profession so i think skill set is required from both side students as well as faculties thank you uh, professor avinash and uh, tejil uh, i see a couple of students just staring at me as to you know why do you then make us you know attend our classes you know so strictly uh, but having said that um, uh, quite inspiring uh, that you know they didn't attend classes for a very brief you know 
semester or so, but then they made up, and that is where they are right now. So thank you for that. Uh, um, I have specific questions to both Deepa and uh, Tejal because uh, we see you as a, fr uh, as a recruiter point of view as well for our students from both Wipro and Questcorp. Uh, what kind of soft skills or uh, you know hard skills I'm talking about? Do you see that our students are you know lacking as they come in as fresh legal professionals? Um, and the reason why I ask is, uh, you know, I want to also speak on behalf of audiences. Is there something that we need to learn so that we teach them? So um, I first wanted to, you know, keep this very, very clear to all of us is legal profession is a responsible and noble profession. So it's not for a sake of just getting the degree, which is in hard skill where we all trying to get the professional competencies, right? Um, we, we are accountable to the society and uh, we, we need to look forward what we can do best to the society. One, As uh, doctor was saying, Avinash was saying, the ambit of legal professional is increasing. So be a, you don't need to be a lawyer. You have to either go to an academics or you have to be an in-house counsel or you get into a judiciary. Today, that's not the scenario. Um, I think Manupatra itself has set the good example. It's a legal services industries are there today, right? Um, when, when we all started, when I was looking at West Law, Manupatra, these kind of a services today, LawSico, which has been one of the legal services industry listed in India first time, I think. So th these things, you all need to get more inspirational and keep it as an aspiration to become the uh, ex exemplary leader in that domain. One. When we when we look at it, both hard skill and soft skills, um, I see hard skills are very, very professional competencies, right? What degree we earn, it doesn't matter today. Uh, as a LLB is just the foundational courses, uh, which is not going to help us. Or even if you are earning, this probably help us to get our monthly income, which is not going to give a food for your thought or satisfaction to you, what you have done or achieved over a period of time, right? Um, if, if we all see that out, there is no jurisprudence. You are all studying as I think uh, there are some of the contemporary views may emerge out of this. I think that's the purpose of this deliberation. I look at it. Um, no jurisprudence today. When you, I don't know how many of us are keep watching on the judgments which are getting delivered today, right? So the judges are writing the first time the judgment with the different perspectives and views. And if you read the judgments, it itself gives the different contours and perspectives. The comparative analysis are happening nowadays in the judgments, what it got delivered. Um, you, you take a recent judgments, you take it even an other related or um, intermediary related or dispute resolution recently, the arbitration, how it is evolving, how mediation has come out. And new laws are emerging. I think you are all so blessed, I can see that out. Um, see that out 1885 Telegraph Act has been replaced with the recent Telecommunication Act of 2023 and 2024. And new labor codes are there. Data Privacy Act has come out. So what you are going to read, the same thing we are going to read, today you are going to compete with the, your experienced veteran in the industry. So how you are going to make a difference? So for us, it's not. It's a legacy system. So we maintain a senior, junior, all that used to happen. Today, it's no way going to happen. Today, tomorrow, you can be the leader. You can set the ground for us. As, as Dr. Avinash said, create an NGO where you create an awareness on your data privacy or cybersecurity issues. I think that's where we are lagging. I think this is what we are expecting. So besides, I, I, I can very clearly say that out. Um, I used to see even our seniors or I was used to take a notes. If we need to file a case, it take one week for preparing it. Okay, uh, Across the room, there will be multiple books. You would have seen that, no movies or even now you can still see that out in the, the family generations. The lot of books has been kept in the cupboards, right? So the journals and commentators to pick up a one single case loss, okay, to reference. And draft the petitions to be filed. It takes a week for us to draft. Okay, today, uh, again, I would like to thank to companies like in Manupatra. Single click, you will get the templates and you will get the reference. You give the scenario or you type it the instance. You are getting the case laws. So it gives the essence of it. What is your precise order of it, right? So you don't need to spend hours together. 
and uh, that gives you a lot of time time management today become a very very crucial it's for everyone it's either a student or educators or at whatever level we are in i think i can say that out um, soft skill one is going to be the key success factor which will differentiate from you within other your peers which is going to set the competitive advantage over others i think that's where you have to focus as tejal indicated there are a lot of skills where we are lagging today you are hard skill of your professional competency is just the gate pass to enter into when your professional start okay how do you embrace explore or flourish in your career purely depends upon your soft skills right and today you have to talk you have to be agile data oriented solution providing approach you cannot just hear you have to listen and give the solutions and in the dynamic industry and digital world you have to give your solution should be tech enabled today you cannot go with your conservative i think i feel soft skill plays a crucial role and uh, being in an organizations or or an institutions like rb university should also encourage them to develop these parallel soft skills to do it um with with one example i will try to make it okay we we i joined in a company my early days uh, and out of my passion i learned the macros okay it's it's in with an excel as tejal said many people may not know excel and um, when i when i joined i i'm talking about 1995 96 okay computers were were there i went to computer lab after my 12th grade so my my still i know the lab guy said hold the mouse okay i hold the mouse but the in the screen i don't know how many of you experience the mouse the cursor is keep going around the corner you couldn't control it so that was the level we used to have that right the exposure on technology and but today it's not the case so that macro helped out of my 10 people okay i i learned it i i get that as and why it is not coming to me where i am lagging so i used to first 5 days you won't believe i just used to have a control on mouse how it works how mouse is interconnected why the wire has to be there then i learned all those things and which helped me to given an another level to learn this macro macro helped me i am talking about 15 20 years before the monthly dashboard to the organization has to be through a macro template you fill in an excel data it become an automated template today you are all talking on robotic so being a legal professional that stood me make me to be an completely competitive agent different from other 10 people who may be senior to me but i got elevated in the next year so i i'm saying that that soft skill today helps me even today the ppt is what uh, tejal was indicating right we introduce a tableau so in 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 my office if you come there is a 40 inch tv the compliance dashboard on live has been going on in our systems as a, as a manpower services company the labor compliance is very crucial for us it's a live dashboard has been displayed so that tableau goes to the leadership automated template no timing anything any data driven however you want the slicing and dicing of the data today so all this which will not come which you cannot be contribute unless you are aware of what's happening in the industry and upgrade yourself to that upskill and reskill yeah thank you teacher so let me say a couple of things i think one is uh similar to in house and law firms uh we still know that law firms are people's first preference uh that is the day one of recruitment uh that happens everyone wants tier one law firms at the most tier two law firms uh corporate law mna and litigation and if you don't get that you consider yourself a failure i think that itself the first thing should be removed from the whole employability sector right uh there are plethora of professions that are coming I think one thing I would defer is the ones who are like you are going to shine anyway. <laughs> the number one, number two, the gold medalists, they will do what they are doing anyway. What we need to focus on is the vast majority of the middle and skill them up because they are the ones who are going to be the backbone of this profession in the future. Okay. First and foremost, 
I think our profession is losing the focus on ethics and integrity. You spoke about law being a noble profession. Why are there so many lawyer jokes and why are they true? I think the problem is this. We are losing the basics of ethics and teaching ethics in our institutions to young students because I have seen a number of young people whose only motive in life is where do I make more money and what is the shortcut that I'm going to use to make that money. I think we need to go back to the fundamentals of ethics across the board. Second aspect, which is a different thing that I, I is my pet peeve, is drafting. You know, everybody knows English, right? So why are lawyers then better or worse than anybody else who has learned the English language? All our laws are in English. You read them, you interpret them. What's the big deal? The reason is there, is there is a purpose to language. And all these short forms, you know, LOL, BTW, something, it doesn't help. It's great for normal day-to-day -day communication, but it is not precise communication. And when it is not precise, that is what our profession looks for, precision. What do you mean when you say this, right? Or what do you mean when you write this? I would really urge law colleges to go back to basic drafting. I have seen the best of students cannot draft a letter, cannot draft a paragraph in a contract, cannot draft a policy. Simple policies cannot, they cannot draft it because they don't, they don't understand the gamut of what they're doing. So I think while we have the internet and we don't really need to know what section 37 is or section 70 is or what it is, I mean, we used to literally mug that up. But you don't have to know that anymore. But you need to know what it means. You need to know how to draft, you know, and communicate because communication is key. So that's the other thing that we look for. The third thing that we really look for uh, is project management. Today, no problem is sim so simple that one person can solve it. Whether it, you are in a law firm, whether you are in uh, uh, litigation, whether you are in-house. Even your counsels today require three, four professionals from different parts of the client. You know, whether it's a finance guy or a supply chain guy or a manufacturing person or an environmental person to brief them on what are the facts. So you always need a cross-functional team. And ability to work with that cross-functional team is very critical to solve a problem. Lawyers think they can write a memo, pros, cons, and somebody will make a decision on what should be done. We do not expect that even of our law firms today. If you give me a pro-con memo with a three-page disclaimer saying, don't sue me for anything, I don't want you. I want a law firm and a lawyer who works with me to provide me the solution. Yes, I understand the risk. We all know the risk. That's why we are going to the expert to say which is a lesser risk. How do you judge that better risk? So the, the piece really being, uh, we're really looking for the middle level of the class being of a certain competence level to be employable. I would love to spend hours and months teaching them, but nobody has that luxury. We all function on headcount. How many people have you employed? How costly are they? And what is the benefit you're getting out of them? It's unfortunate, but it's a fact. So I cannot afford to say that I will take 30 kids I will spend the next six months teaching them, and then we will see if they become productive. And by the time, three of them will leave, four of them will decide to go abroad, five of them will decide to move for 10,000 rupees more, and you've gone through this whole process of not having somebody who's contributed at all to you or to your organization. So it's a dichotomy between, I think, what teachers face and what employers face, and we have to balance that along the way. 
And last but not the least is what I would talk about is my other pet peeve is too many electives. There are certain basic laws you must know. I really, I mean, I'm not sort of putting it down. It's very interesting areas of law that you can have debate on over chai. But they are not what is going to, what you're going to use on day one. You know, learning about the FTA agreement between India and Sweden, great. Do it in your spare time, do it in the evening. But you have to know the basics. I know students who are talking about all sorts of complicated legal questions. But they don't come about in your first two years of work. I don't want to debate, you know, on, on things that have no meaning. So I, I might say this a little controversially, but common sense is not common. We must have basic knowledge of basic things taught to our students so that they can be useful while they learn. It can't just be, you know, pulling out thousands of graduates. I think it's too easy to graduate. This is one of the countries where law is easy to graduate. You try passing the bar exam in the US. Look at the percentages of people passing. They can't pass. And we are just churning out lawyers like there's no tomorrow. So people who want to be lawyers must, must go through a little more rigor than people who are substituting an LLB for a BA is, is my view. Thanks. Professor Arunash. Uh, I think uh, it's my duty to <laughs> respond to Tezel. <laughs> Uh, Tezal, I'm, I'm so sorry with due respect, I think there are a few things which you need to understand. In my statement, I told that uh, there's an employable, employability part and trust me to make someone employable in a law firm or in a in-house, frankly speaking, you don't need five years. You know, you can develop a six-month certificate program, okay? And uh, those guys can be trained enough to get an entry-level job. Yeah, because ultimately you don't need someone who is very specialized in something, an entry-level job, you give them basic things. And an entry-level job, definitely no one is going to give very broad ideas about the solutions. Their job is to do maybe basic research, basic drafting and assisting seniors in some basic job. So that employability skills can be developed in six months, just like engineering colleges are doing now. What they are doing, you don't learn anything in the third year, we will teach you coding for three months and you will get a job in a IT company. Same thing in MBA also. Uh, MBA in finance, if you talk about some broader ideas about the finance, they can't reply. I disagree with this approach. I believe that the purpose of a law school is not only to give a job. Unfortunately, this idea is emerging now or it's only <laughs> corporate job. But the beauty of law schools, when you talk about the electives, we are creating social leaders for this country. Our graduates are going to become judge. Our graduates are going to become advocates in courtroom, NGOs, think tank, social leaders. That's why we as a teachers, we like to give them different electives. So as per their interest area, they can choose some areas. Okay. Maybe like if I talk about human rights, not necessarily direct connecting with the employability, but maybe a student is interested to understand about the, you know, marginalized society and the law. So this elective is very much required. Students can choose their elective as per their interest area, because unlike engineering and uh, management, law students are not going only in corporate. Unfortunately, or most of the NLUs and some top class private universities, they are only talking about corporate placement. That's very unfortunate. Actually, the best of the best mind earlier used to go in litigation, judiciary, or some social services, civil services. Now, because of this mindset, they are going only in corporate. That's very problematic. 
So that's why I argued in the second line that in law schools, as a teachers, it's a teacher's conclave, that's why I'm addressing to teachers, not to students. That as a teacher, we need to again regenerate this idea that when you are in a law school, you are not here only to get a job in corporate. You can do other things also. You can become a judge. Unfortunately, we are not talking about in top class law schools anymore. The judiciary, public prosecutor, uh, public sector enterprises, advocacy, social service, leadership. These are the areas where law school students can do wonderful job. So I think that's why in our law school we need to maintain a balance. Few students would like to go for a corporate career, we need to give them soft skills, hard skills, required skills which you both have mentioned. But other part, we also need to talk about. That all students are not here only for a corporate job. Few, and not few, I believe almost 30 to 40 percent students must go in non-corporate job. And that's why I agree with you, it's very easy to get a job, uh, sorry, degree in India. Law degree. Why? Because it's a temptation. Law schools are selling law school, legal education like in a corporate placement. I'm also doing it. <laughs> yeah, I must confess that we are all talking about placement, just like an MBA in engineering, but it's a fraud. You know why this is a fraud? Legal market is very small. So if 50,000 students are taking admission in five-year LLB program in India, I can give you <laughs> very clearly, corporate cannot accommodate more than 1,000 students every year combined law firms and in-house. But uh, we are not telling this fact to students. Tier for like Amarchand Mangaldas, how many students they take every year? Maximum 40, 50. So it's very clear that out of 50,000, only 1,000, maximum 1,500 students can go in corporate sector. But the entire narration of the higher education in legal side is just like corporate placement. It's a fraud. I think we need to tell them that everybody will not get a job in corporate sector. You need to explore other areas also. That's why I'm very surprised to see even the top class law school graduates are not able to get a job because they train themselves only for a corporate job which did not happen and definitely it cannot happen for all and now they are unemployed. They don't have, they don't have courage to go to courtroom. Thanks to our Delhi University, there was no placement. So we never thought about placement. When I graduated from law faculty, Delhi University, there was no placement. Very simple. We gave you training, education, now you explore your life. And as per my understanding, my all batchmates, they are doing amazing jobs in corporate, litigation, judiciary, public service. Because we were trained for life. Law school should train students for life, not for a job. So I think we need to change this narration as a teacher. When we go back to our law school, maybe at the top level, you know, administration level, it's not easy to talk all these things. But as a teacher, within your group, within classroom, you know, you should tell students, buddy, it's not necessary that you will get a job in corporate. And it will not happen, Tejal. It's not practically possible. All students are even not intellectually or academically smart to get a job in corporate. We need to give them real picture. Why you will not get job in corporate. Why don't you try for litigation or a government job? Become an SSE, become a police officer, become a bank officer. Try something else also. Not necessary that you are in law school, you have to get a job in law firm or in a company. Because only 5% student can get a job. So we need to create new narration in our law schools so that our law school students must be courageous to explore other areas. They should not be so desperate to get a job in corporate, which will definitely not happen for 95% students. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Avinash. Uh, as law teachers, we know now the blend that we have to create for our students with the three panelists. I, we will now leave the floor for discussion. 
in case you have any questions please do raise your hand and we will direct the mic to you you can direct your question to our panelists specifically or to all of them please introduce yourself i think uh, we are talking about the employability uh, within the country okay employability is a big challenge only corporates but can we think because today we are you know sitting here as a law teachers uh, today globe is open we all know that you know now if you have a talent globe is open boundaries are becoming a uh, meaningless i mean to say that uh, today legal service is part of the globalization so we talked so much you know like i heard last one hour about you know employability within the country but i'm just want to share that if we have a talent i don't know because we are all you know teachers today legal service is part of the globalization india is a party to w2o gats how many of we know that that is a different thing so another 5 years 10 years our litigation is going to blend with you know lot of international sort of thing so employability for example i'll tell you maybe some of you know maybe i'll stand so there is a gats agreement that is all services 160 plus services today part of that including legal service that's why i'm taking you know w2o gats so this service uh, you know now it's part of the globalization india is committed of course becoming a party to any treaty is a sovereign prerogative of the country but india already you know made it and uh, today we have to open up though there are cases you know bala jk bala ji case uh, 2012 2 today our judiciary is of the view that you know we can't open up that but it's uh, not going to work long run because india already committed so we can think of the opportunities outside the country i know india you know 21st century we all know friends we are all law teachers it is the 19th century the globe ruled by small country uk 20th century it's the american and 21st century is asian century i can s- proudly say that it is a indian century so we have to think you know because part of this gats agreement the legal service today modes of supply any service but i am talking about legal service cross border services you know both service provider and receiver sits in the respective countries and service happens and you get your for example i am you know a legal advisor advising my client in usa through phone or fax or email so i'll get my money are they boundaries are uh, no boundaries at all so can we think but here only thing is we all law teachers have to think that are we prepared to face that global competition if global competition we are i know we know we know that all are you know like other professions whether it's a engineering doctors technocrats go global presence is there but why not lawyers if you say that you know best doctors available across the globe you know indian doctors i am talking about indian engineers but why not you know indian lawyers what went wrong i think you know that's one we can you know Sir, can i respond yeah it's possible but hmm. it's not going to happen simple why if we believed mm. that the legal market is only english speaking countries like the fra uh, sorry uk us australia canada mm. and two or three more countries mm. definitely our indian lawyers and indian law school students are restricting the market space and those markets are already overcrowded so when students who are going to us for their llm after spending 60 to 70 lakh rupees they are not able to get job in us or uk and they come back so the problem with our indian legal education is not that our students are not talented they are highly talented competent hard working the problem is the language you know why indian it software engineers are able to do job in poland france spain italy everywhere because that language is technology you don't need to speak local language but if we want to achieve this goal which is really noble goal and can be achieved but then we need to teach foreign language in our law schools and the mockery of our higher education in higher education in india legal education we teach foreign language we teach french for 30 hours in two semesters and we believe that that's enough because now you can speak bonju kamo sawa that's all if we really want to train global lawyers we need to teach them a foreign language like for example if i want to get a job in spanish world spain and south america almost there are 30 to 40 countries if i can speak good fra- a good spanish written speaking 
if i can do well in spanish definitely that market is open for me and indians are so smart if they can speak that language you throw them anywhere they will find a job they will develop their own practice i think that's indians are very good in that indian le legal education because of this language barrier our students are really struggling if we want to achieve this global job we need to teach a foreign language for 10 semesters and in minimum we have to achieve b1 level a1 a2 b1 minimum we have to achieve b1 level in language proficiency then definitely sir your idea can be implemented and this can be possible but if we teach foreign language for minimum 500 hours in 5 year so i think it's a great sir, idea it is not my mandate it is a mandated by the government we are party to that so un unfortunately we are ignorant but if not today we are not tomorrow, training na sir tejal wants to respond no, but, I, but i have yeah. to say that i did yeah. asia pacific for 14 years i didn't know the laws or the language of any of the 12 countries <laughs> so i will completely agree on the fact that indian students are smart enough to find their way and make make it language is a barrier but it's an entry barrier after a point i don't think it matters uh so i definitely think opening up the global market is huge but the competency levels have to increase a lot more a lot more than they are actually we have been lucky that law has been a protected profession in india and it is not open to the foreign market yet when you see that competition it's not just us going and succeeding outside how will we succeed when our market opens are we competent enough to do that i think is also very critical i want to your point from the from the employability from the employability perspective when you look at it right i think today um maybe tejal myself or setting the ground or maybe in good example as well it's it's no need to be as you said you no need to be present in the country we are virtually managing i'm handling right now 10 plus countries probably you know tejal is handling 50 plus countries and today in our gc fraternity right we are operating out of india we taken a control of all these country we become a group general councils right so that's whether you know the law or not how you are embracing yourself to those and building your global competency to manage and how contextually you are communicating with your stakeholders with a diverse background and diverse culture and uh, time management yes that's that's the one where we need to develop an another skill along with the language um you need to adopt to work so we 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 our day starts in the morning to cope up with the asian market and australia and then we have to end up with the uk and us to go with that so that's the that's the time where you have to factor how you are going to work the market is open and it's it's ocean how we are focusing and how we are going to take this up that i think that's the one thing uh, probably i i i maybe uh, giving uh, my other two cents on this in the later part as well so we can look at uh delegates we only can afford to have two questions i'm watching the time i also have a responsibility of being the faculty coordinator now that's a drawback yeah so yes <laughs> i was uh, so my university is national university of singapore that's where i did my law and research also i've observed uh, you know in the i mean in in sense that when in singapore i had to make this observation in asean also we had a 50% of our time went to research a lot of investment goes into r&d and this is true i can say across the board for um what we generally call in asia as the tiger economies right taiwan singapore hong kong and that zone um the 50% here is not research intensive um first of all we had research as a not as a uni dimensional or speci specialization but it was across the board a lot of our time was actually spent with uh, multidisciplinary projects my own doctoral postdoc is multidisciplinary right i do a lot of ecology esg work now so esg is not really you know it cuts at the intersections so this intersection and interdisciplinary research was actually their edge and this is true right through japan 
it's not language or anything. It's just the focus on research. Because once you're in R&D, you can figure out the technology, you can forget, fig figure out field research, et cetera. So that applied research was very, very intensive. And that's how we were trained. And then came the jurisprudence, et cetera. Those were, those were the, you know, the, the hygiene factors, I would say maintenance. So you had, you had bare minimum, you just had a minimum scale. But I see that missing once, I mean, to be very honest, this is my feedback to a lot of places where I'm visiting faculty also. I see that missing except for sciences except for STEM, but there it was actually STEAM, because arts was also a part. So we had minors in a National University of Singapore, like uh, you had a psychology minor or philosophy, philosophy. So those kind of disciplines, you know, um, interdisciplinary also came. Also, they had a lot of focus on ecology and something which is future-based. So they encouraged that sort of research and the legal students, science students, they used to hybridize those you know what I'm talking about, because technology is like a hybridization. It's not like one issue can be multidimensional, multidisciplinary. That research focus, how do you build that? Because given that you have a survival parameters, and then you have something, you have seminal parameters. So for example, I'll give you a case study. So a lot of the work that Tata's or some, you know, certain groups do, some of Google does, they are incubators within. So that R&D develops as maybe a something new. So you, you, to, you talk about NGO entrepreneurship, but that those, those are built through research, through field exposure, et cetera. How do you allocate the time and resources? Because National University used to have networks all over the place. They used to send people all over. Our uh, research in Taiwan showed something very different from Singapore, et cetera. So these are cross-discussed. I don't see that happening much in India because the cross-pollination, cross-discussion, that's one thing missing, the research and this. Uh, and the third factor that I really is sharing. One thing I can tell you, nobody will share knowledge just like that. Because obviously it's a, I mean, I'm an IP, I was in IP law. I know how intellectual property works. And it's not going to be open source all the time, but there are going to be creating these kind of spearheading these projects, being part of those conclaves, et cetera. So those have a, you know, a collaboration sort of thing. So NUS used to um, get together, bring together those ideas and add a lot of integration is required. I'm saying a lot of unification is also required. So how do you institutionalize that? Because individuals come and go, but my faith is more in institutionalizing this. So these three things are just my two cents. So after that, you will be the last. Uh, I think uh, I think you asked so many questions. It's difficult to answer which one I should reply. Uh, but considering the time limit, I would like to say one thing. See, research is a good idea, but at the UG level, uh, objectives are different. UG is more uh, teaching in intensive because it's a regulated program in India. Bar Council of India asks you to teach uh, almost 60 hours per paper. So more or less. Practically speaking, our Indian students and faculties, they don't have much time to train our UG students for research. Because the objective of the UG is basically to create lawyers, judges, and to make them lawyer. Yes, PG level and PhD level, it can be done. At the UG level, maybe in advanced classes in fourth and fifth year, when they are ready to you know, have some free time, they can do these type of research projects. So that's a one idea. Second, you talk about this interdisciplinary. In India, we have BALLB, BBLLB, so students are getting interdisciplinary learning. However, because we are all teachers, so we can laugh, you know. When we teach law and economics in India, we teach classical economics. Okay, we don't teach law and economics approach. So this interdisciplinary learning is really missing in India, especially in law schools. I'm not talking about learn from outside. But within the law school, I am not sure when we teach uh, like the sociology and law, uh, that person is really competent to teach that paper or not. Because mostly we are hiring social, very classical professors. So yeah, interdisciplinary is a serious issue. I appreciate your concern. Okay. Uh, yes. We can, can have I? only one question. Yes, sir. Tejil or Deepa, do you? Yeah. Um, we can only afford to have one question. Yes, Please sir. be brief, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, panelists, for sharing. Uh, this law profession is not for uh, generating employment. It is for creating the professionals. Now, what is lagging behind is the problem of language. The one and only problem is the language, as rightly put in by you, panelists. Now, 
the basic requirements for our students, which is the concept of IELTS, the listening, reading, speaking, and writing. Now, are we taking the effort of doing this in our curriculum? The four major factors which is missing in all the students is the four problem, listening, reading, writing, and speaking. If we are going to engage some resource person for this particular problem, I think our students will be the gem of the product available in the market. They can face any kind of challenges. They can make themselves comfortable to any level of position. They can compete among themselves for any range of employment. That's it. Thank you. Teju? No, that's part of what I said. It's really a part of can you write, do you read well, and attention to detail. <coughs> I mean, very often the questions I'm asking are, have you even read this? If you are not reading it, then who's reading it? But I think that superficiality has come in on I can wing this, right? I, I, I know it. You know, I can just give some, you know, high-level conversations. It doesn't work. Uh, the pr profession is a detailed profession. And, and I will not, and I want to just say it just as a remark. And I answered the employability question because it was asked. But there is an employability factor because there's a sustainability factor. Right? Uh, and I'm not saying we don't have electives or you don't create thinkers. But at some point, we've got to decide that the undergraduate degree is leading to the profession or leading to a, a constructive uh, output, or it is only a base degree. But we can't be confused. Because I think this confusion is what is causing the problem. Is it a basic degree or is it a degree that is giving you specialized skills like a doctor is being given? And I think that is where the confusion lies. And the more confused we are, the more we are confusing our students as to what they should be and what they should do. So I, I'm not sort of advocating for everyone being in an air-conditioned office and working, but that's what our country unfortunately wants to do. But it's OK. Give the open minds, do whatever, but do it in your first three years. Do it in your first four years. But after that, you got to get somewhere, right? We can't have a generation of people who forever are undecided about anything. We will change three, four professions in our life. We all live now very, very long. So nobody's going to do the same career forever. But at least when you're doing it, be focused on what you're doing. Uh, yeah, lastly. Thanks, thanks, uh, Professor, bringing this out. I think uh, that's the context where, you, as you rightly said, we need to focus. So any any deliberation, it's always two sides of the coin, right? So we, we have spoken on the, the last 30, 45 minutes of how students has to be, how we can create employability, what focus. As a legal educators, in, in the 21st century, what we are looking out, right? My, my foremost thinking is, the professors and the institution should be aware of the changes what's happening in the industry and society today. What is the requirement, challenges, and opportunities which is available in front of us? If you are not having the clarity on this or not understanding the requirements, I don't think so we can we can able to um, prepare or build the better professional for the future. That's one. Second thing, in the landscape, I, I have my own philosophy, okay, as you rightly said, uh, you have a limited hours. So I used to tell to my professor as well, you, you have a defined syllabus, right? You are conducting my assessment on the syllabus and you are giving the mark. If you look at it, you are creating a boundary of illiteracy by indicating that you are imparting a legal education, right? You, you define the 36 subject as a papers today. But the law is vast, and what's happening on that, we, nobody is going to look at it. My one aspect, what I've been requesting, even the leg legal educators or academic or institution to focus is, in, in your institutions, you should just benchmark. You should look at it, how we are going to do it. When, when Professor was saying the global opportunities, how many of our students are attending, I think, international mood courts? Is an India is recognized in any of a single mood court? How many are happening in space-related mood courts? Environmental law. 
we we still looking at a people to training the mood court i have been seeing constitution civil law criminal law now i think recent deliberation which is happening around the technology and data privacy there are e commerce as she said est right there are multidisciplinary functions are happening so our own legal educator should be aware of it and you have to collaborate you you have to look at it your curriculum and pedagogy in a such a way that what can you can bring the change in your system you don't look at it government needs to change or bca needs to change i think right you are all the ambassadors i keep telling my legal team you are all the ambassadors of an organization whatever happens so you have to front and i think you are all the ambassadors of the institutions and you the, the life of the legal professional i think 40000 to 50000 uh, lawyers are you know uh, every year they are coming out you are you are guiding them so as tejal said leave the top one they are they know what they want to be leave the bottom line whatever may they will survive they i know they will be shining stars but the middle layer who are typically sitting in the classroom relying on the legal educators right they are your kids you need to handhold them how are you going to handhold before we go i i very sorry but but i let me put across it's a one single ppt i have seen in in my college days what they have taken slightly it's modified it's still going on to even today i think that's not the way the education or teaching today needs to be done it has to be relooked at today transformation has to happen to match with the multidisciplinary function i know we are all uh, governed by certain guidelines regulations of the courses i am not denying it yes let's go for it but as a educators you have to look at a few scenarios right one how can you collaborate and communicate with your external policy makers stakeholders or corporate or legislative assemblies so many laws has been passed how many of us has given a white paper from an institutions you you are the futures you have to look at it what the law needs to be for next 50 years and 100 years why don't we take those initiative in our in organization or institutions i think that's where i i expect the legal educators to go through second you have to collaborate i don't think so the the people like us or tejal any time you no know, restricting ourselves not to come so there are forums like a general council association or other forums why you need a uh, institutions like manupatra to come and organize this you can go reach them write to them there is a cell see over and above i feel there should be an every institution set up an um, innovation sandbox how the tech companies and r and d department sets you should set up something and there will be a multidisciplinary the kids the, the volunteers how it is different from your global competency and global law colleges why harvard has been listed as a number 1 oxford is number 2 how we need to benchmark it how we can differently think how can we create a curriculum or one extra my one part i keep telling to everyone including my 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 own team or at family or personal level see the you cannot make people or students learn everything right but see the habit of learning please ask them to learn every day at least 2 hours other than their subjects what's happening on the today the medias are there social medias are there please make them to get and you you have to be an intrinsic motivator i don't want to you all to be an extrinsic motivators extrinsic is just focusing on numbers and as you said you will get a placement which will help you to live your livelihoods one point of time it will become a static or redundant i don't think so then you will become a leader with a management capabilities to handle any domain or handling in society i think setting up an innovation sandbox may be another idea and don't look at it a placement as an opportunity or or placing an internship as a good opportunity rather i also suggest create a mentor mentee program within your own systems i think this mentor mentee program it doesn't mean that it has to be in a corporate or it has to be in a school or it has to be in a working environment it has to be in your college as well create the senior who passed out i think uh, we do have an alumni so we are creating but how are you going to utilize your alumni right so bring them build that network i think that's the other one aspect i think we need to be looking at and uh, in in our own you no know, members students i know definitely there are tech savvies today they can develop an application other thing create an application create a platform or social media where you can connect with your global students 
Exchange your ideas, thoughts. Don't wait for a forum to happen or conclave to happen. Create this as a habit of a weekly, monthly, fortnightly, as in, as in discussion, deliberation points. Whether it's a one participant or 100 participant or 1,000, it doesn't matter. Encourage the student to come back with their own thoughts. Put it across it. Get away from your shyness. I think those things, you know, will make your student would be the fit for the society. That's where we all need to focus. Um, the other one angle which, which I probably would like to was another one area where you need to learn. You are all learning. It's not for money. You have to, as a noble profession, responsible citizen, you have to give it back to society at some point of time. Whatever it means, whatever scale it is, don't worry. I think that's where we all need to probably you know, uh, enlighten them, embrace them beyond your subjects, beyond your syllabus. Create this platform. I think the, the institution which is creating this platform um, is going to be the number one in whatever level, whether India or don't look at it, what you have achieved and what you are trying to keep it in your marketing and how that is going to come back. But if you are seeding this, I'm 100% I'm sure 20 years down the line or 10 years down the line, if any of one student coming back and appreciating, I think that's where you can see. So as a teachers, I think you're all later. Today, what we are, I think I, I always thankful and grateful to my, my teachers who has seeded all this. Extraordinary thoughts. They never thought that, told that you get into corporate, you get into academic. Yeah. So they made us, if I'm good in the oratorical, they allowed me to talk, make me to present the presentation. Nobody used to sit in the classroom. It's four people. My teacher used to sit. They will ask questions. You go through commentators, come back, analyze. So how many of us today making the case study research? When she was saying, every week there are four to five cases which is getting you know, awarded in the Supreme Court. It's the Every case study itself is not you know, it's a knowledge base. You, without a technology, you cannot understand the, how he has decided. Without any healthcare related uh, concerns, you may not understand the issues, how they are raising it out. I think my, my humble request to legal educators is, please have the open mind to feedback. Listen to the students. Collaborate with students. Uh, don't, don't be, be conservative or, or no, uh, the legacy of uh, teacher ending. Bring the, the, the inter personal touch, personal touch and discussion between the students and the teachers. And uh, technology should not replace your uh, human element. I think in, in all, the, all the journey, you have to ensure they are ethically and uh, always working with, with an integrity. Uh, that's, that's my two cents. To Thank that. you. Yeah.